My name is Tom, and I'd like to share a story from my college days. As you can probably imagine, it's not a very nice story, but I like to think that it's something others can take something away from, be that a life lesson or whatever else. I was pretty wild in college. You wouldn't think it if you looked at me, but it's true. I did okay in my freshman year, tried to keep my head straight and focus on my studies, but then the sophomore party lifestyle hit me pretty hard. I've also always looked a little older than I was, so although getting carded was standard on campus, if I drove into the city, I could pick up a six-pack almost anywhere. And that was not conducive to a healthy study and party balance. I would regularly find myself forced to walk home from some bar at 2am, having spent all my money on shots with no charge on my phone to call a cab. A normal person might have that happen to them once, but me... It happened at least half a dozen times than I can remember. The last time, I had just gotten back on the campus after walking maybe two or three miles completely drunk, and I was incredibly tired. I was sobering up, in a terrible mood, and all I wanted to do was get back to my dorm so I could get to that bottle of vodka that I kept hidden in my dorm. But then, I run into this kindly stranger. There's a guy smoking a cigarette outside his block, and he says something sort of softly to me as I walk past him. It was something like, crazy night, or wild night, and I must have just grunted until I saw him smoking. I asked him to bum one, and did so. Then we made a little small talk before he invited me inside for a beer and to charge my phone. This guy was still living in the dorms, albeit the nicer kind on the other side of campus, but having alcohol was still very much against the rules. Most heavy partiers had something stashed away somewhere, but this guy had a mini fridge that had beer cans tucked behind sodas. He said no one suspected him because he was such a nerd, and he was kind of right, I guess, because he didn't give off party vibes, but I just found myself seriously impressed. Well, more just wanting to have another beer before I walked the final 20 minutes to my dorm, but impressed nevertheless. I go up to this guy's room, and there it was, beer, hiding in plain sight. I asked to use the guy's bathroom before we drank and he showed me where it was and when I got back we talked and drank and at one point I knew I probably should have started walking back but I figured that I could just rest a little longer. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the last thing I remember. I woke up the next morning in the hallway outside the guy's apartment. I was fully clothed but my shoes were out there with me. It must have been late morning because it was pretty busy outside, meaning people definitely must have stepped over me while passed out in the hallway. I felt like death, and I probably looked about the same too. I know I attracted a few looks as I sort of moseyed across campus and back to my room. I'd been really drunk before, but never blackout drunk, and let me tell you, it was not a good feeling. I haven't even put it together why I'd been cruising along just fine before that one beer knocked me out completely cold. I honestly just figured that I was exhausted from hours of drinking then miles of walking, but as I said, I had made that walk five or six times previous, probably having drank even more on some occasions, and I'd never blacked out like that until that night. I figured a lot of you probably have put it together already. Things are sometimes clearer from a distance like that, you know? But never underestimate the power of denial, especially when it comes to young men. I think a year went by before I was really faced with what had happened to me. I always knew in the back of my head, I mean, but like I'd already covered, I had that head buried firmly in the sand. In the 12 months or so since I blacked out, the same thing happened to multiple guys from our university and even some of the locals too. They were walking someplace late at night ran into a kind of stranger who offered them beer or maybe a phone charge or whatever they just happened to need at that moment. They then went up to this guy's apartment or got into his car or whatever and he offers them a drink. And then boom, they wake up hours later with no memory of the evening's events. You might think that it'd be those with clear ideas or suspicions that it'd be the first to raise the alarm, but in reality, the opposite is true. The more of an idea that they had of what happened, the more compartmentalizing went on, allowing our seemingly kind stranger to get away with his crimes for a long time. It wasn't until a dude went to a doctor, having no idea why he hurt so much that 
The cops were even informed that something was going on on campus. Then I don't know how, but they caught up with the guy, arrested him, and then the whole story was in the media within just a few days. The cops think this kindly stranger assaulted anywhere between 18 to 100 different assaults in the space of two years. And you read that right. 18 confirmed, 100 possible, and I heard almost a dozen were almost talked into testifying, but withdrew one by one in the run-up to the trial itself. Testifying would mean admitting what had happened to them, something that some guys just aren't willing to do. I guess that applies to both sexes, but it especially applies to men. I know that because I was one of those who withdrew. I figured if so many others were brave enough to say it out loud, I wouldn't need to. But that's not how it works. The kindly stranger who invited me into his dorm room that night got more than 500 years in prison on account of the 18 separate accounts that he was convicted of, plus a bunch of other crimes thrown in there too. It was good news to most, but to me, it meant facing up to what had happened to me, which honestly has been the single toughest thing I'd ever had to do. I've since worked with an organization called One in Six, named so because statistically, one in six men will be intimately assaulted or violated at some point in their lives, but because of how little we talk about it, you'd think the number is much, much lower. Well, it's not. And if the issues I just discussed affects any of your viewers, I strongly advise them to go visit www.1in6.org. There's a lot of advice and information there. Just don't close yourselves off and suffer in silence. Because silence is the real killer. So back when I was in college here in Germany, me and a few friends of mine were invited to a house party one weekend. It wasn't sold as being some crazy all-night rave or anything like that, but since the drinking age is much lower than in the US, there had been a lot of beer, and it was certain to get pretty wild. In light of that, me and my friends were really excited. We knew that there were going to be girls, and being the young single guys that we were, we knew that it would be a great place to meet some potential dates and, you know, do some flirting. We arrived stinking of cologne, wearing terrible button-up shirts with our beer in tow, and then we sat up in the corner and just sort of awkwardly were drinking amongst ourselves for a while. But then the more we drank, the more confident we got, and slowly but surely we started to mingle. One of my friends started putting it on with a few different girls, and at first it was funny to watch him struggle. He was our designated driver for the evening, meaning that he hadn't been drinking and was therefore still very nervous and pretty clumsy. But then, we saw that the attraction to one of the girls was very much reciprocated. We were happy for him, but as much as I'd like to tell you that we were mature and gave him some space, that wasn't the case at all. We kept harassing him and his potential date, playfully of course, but it was still unwelcome. Eventually, he told us to leave them alone because we were ruining his chances with her and only then did we finally respect his wishes and just leave him in peace. We were pretty drunk by that period, so we just went off and entertained ourselves so he could get some space. Now, a little time goes by and we start wondering where our sober friend and his lady are. We looked around everywhere for them, checking all of the bedrooms in the house, but all were occupied with people drinking or smoking and our friend seemed to be nowhere to be seen. But then, in the process of looking for him, we found the girl's friends, and after asking where the new couple was, we discovered that they'd gone out to my friend's car for some alone time together. We knew exactly what they were up to, and although the girl's friends made us promise to leave them alone, we just had to get a picture or two for posterity, being immature and whatnot, you know the deal. I fully admit that our plan made us total a-holes and that violating someone's intimate privacy is not only wrong, but also completely against the law to be honest, and we didn't end up taking pictures or video of anyone that night, as you'll soon come to learn. In order to maintain the element of stealth, only one of us would creep up towards my friend's car before secretly recording whatever was going on inside, that was the plan at least. And that person wasn't me, so the rest of us sort of held back at the party to make it look like we weren't doing exactly what it is we were doing. We talked to the girl's friends, kept them occupied trying and failing to flirt with them until we started to grow impatient. All our friend with the phone had to do was run up to the car, 
snap a few pictures, and then run back with his prize. But longer and longer went by, and there was no sign of our friend with the camera phone. Unable to wait any longer, I went outside to look for him, but instead of secretly filming our friend and his girl in the car, I found him sitting on the curb with no car in sight. He was on the phone with someone, so I figured shutting up and listening would get more answers than asking questions he wouldn't respond to. As I listened, I worked out the call was obviously a serious one, and by the end of it, I was almost certain that, number one, he'd been crying, and number two, that the call sounded like it had been with the police. I asked him where our friend with the car was, and he just shook his head and told me we need to leave. When he looked up at me, it became clear that yes, he had been crying, but why? He didn't tell me until we took a taxi back to his apartment, and over a few more beers and some cigarettes, he told me what happened. He tried to take some pictures as planned, but when he got to our friend's car, he found him in the passenger seat alone. His head was in his hands, and he was in this terrible state with tears streaming down his face. My friend with the phone kept asking what happened with the girl, over and over, and but our friend with the car wouldn't say anything. Wouldn't or couldn't, I don't know, but my phone friend walks around to the passenger side to climb in and talk to him with some privacy, and he asks again, what happened with the girl? And our friend with the car just points to the back seat, and that's when he realizes that our friend isn't alone in the car. He never was, and that under the blanket on the back seat, he recognized the shape of a person. It was the girl that he'd been with, and she wasn't breathing. But when my friend with the phone asked what had happened, car friend just kept saying, I don't know, I don't know. At first, he maybe thought that the girl had had a seizure or maybe a free card failure, and he kept saying to call 112, which is the emergency number here in Germany for fire or medical. But my friend with the car, he wouldn't call. He kept saying things like, just wait a minute, I need to think, and other things to delay my other friend. My friend with the phone said that he jumped out of the car out of instinct, realizing that he was getting his DNA and all of those things on what was now the scene of the crime, being very paranoid. There was no other reason why he would refuse to call the emergency number or try to delay in any way, or why he'd cover her body instead of just running to get help or maybe even trying to get her out. My friend with the phone then told the other to get out of his car, but he wouldn't. He just suddenly started the engine and drove off before my friend could stop him. He then was faced with a choice, run and get us, which is what he really wanted to do because he was completely freaked out, or do the right thing, be a man and just call the 110 number instead, which is not the number for medical, it's the number for the police. We later discovered that the friend with the car had somehow suffocated this girl, although we never found out exactly how. He planned to drive into the River Main to take his own life and hide what he'd done, but he couldn't go through with it and was found by the police and subsequently arrested. He pled guilty to everything to try and get as little time in prison as possible, and for a while it was a big story, but now for most people it's half a forgotten memory, really. When I recall it, my mind always seemed to land on one specific thing my friend said when he was in his apartment afterwards. He said realizing that he sat in the car with a dead body, as well as the killer themselves, was the scariest feeling he'd ever felt. It's the kind of moment that would top anybody's list of their life's scariest moments. But he said that just seconds later he was faced with something that was somehow even more terrifying to him. He was terrified that one of the dead girl's friends was going to ask him where she was, and how he wouldn't be able to tell her. I just tried to be the best friend I could to him and get him away from the party before his worst fear came true. But I also understand how selfish it was of us not to warn anyone what had happened. Those girls might have carried on partying for a while, not knowing that one of their close friends was gone forever. This is something that happened during my freshman year of college. It was a few years ago now, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. At the time, I went to a university with about 10,000 students. For my first year, I lived in an all-female dorm building on the third floor. There were four floors total, and I had my own dorm room all to myself. On probably the third or fourth week of school, I went to bed one night just like any other. It was a weeknight, but I don't remember exactly what day. 
I woke up though at around three o'clock in the morning and really had to use the bathroom. The bathrooms were just a ways down the hallway, so I got out of bed and headed to the door. When I got out into the hallway, it was empty and things were very quiet. I had to walk maybe between 50 and 100 feet to get to the bathrooms. Once I was there, the bathrooms that we had was basically a room with five doors and a sink. Each door was its own little private bathroom. Nobody was inside and all of the doors were open when I got there. Not surprising for it being three o'clock in the morning. As I was inside one of the rooms, I heard footsteps come from the hallway. Whoever it was then entered the bathrooms and went into one of the rooms across from me. I didn't think too much of it. I was inside for maybe a minute and then left. When I did, the other person was still inside the one across from me. Basically, right when I got back into the hallway, I heard the other bathroom door open. Then, when I was maybe 30 feet away from the bathrooms walking to my room, I heard them start walking in the hallway behind me. I still didn't think much of it at the time, and I expected it to be another girl. But something about it just seemed odd, I don't really know why. I looked over my shoulder to see who it was, but when I did, I saw that it was a man. And it wasn't a college-aged man either. This guy looked much older than me. I was really confused by this. I turned back and kept walking from my room. But instantly, I heard the man speed up his steps. He was walking pretty fast and starting to gain on me. I got a really bad feeling and I sped up as well. By now, I was pretty close to my door and I hadn't locked it with me only going to the bathroom. That was good, meaning I could get inside faster. I could hear the man still getting closer and closer to me and I started to feel panic setting into my mind. Now, I was only about 10 feet away and the guy was less than 20 feet behind me. When I got to the door, I quickly opened it, got inside, and then shut the door and locked it behind me. Probably a second later, the guy stopped right outside my door. He then tried opening the door, and my heart started racing even faster than it already was. Then he knocked on it. I had no clue who this guy was or what he wanted. I knew that he wasn't supposed to be here, though. I chose not to answer the door. I also didn't bother to ask him what he was doing or who he was. There was about 30 seconds of silence after he knocked. I was hoping that he would have gone away, but then he knocked on the door again. It wasn't a very loud knock at all, and after he knocked, I walked over to the door and looked through the peephole. He was sort of short and wearing a black jacket and had sort of blonde hair. I didn't know who he was. He definitely didn't work at the school or anything either. He knocked again for a third time. I really wanted him to just go away. There was no way that I was going to be able to get any sleep with this guy here. He didn't say anything the entire time, but was just standing there. I went away from the door and sat on my bed. I waited, and the guy didn't knock for a really long time. But when I went back over to the door and looked out, thinking maybe he was gone, the guy was still there. I didn't know what to do. I walked back over to my bed. Then the guy knocked one more time was really quiet and I just barely heard it because of how quiet it was. I didn't get up to look. I stayed where I was and probably 10 more minutes went by. I didn't hear any noises and got up to look again. That's when I saw that the guy was finally gone. After that, I was finally able to get back to sleep. The next morning, I found my resident advisor and told her about the man. She said that she was going to report it. Luckily, I never saw the guy again after that. A few days later though, I found out that the man had been let into the building much earlier that night. He had told a student that his daughter lived there and he had to give her something. The student let him in, believing his story. It turned out that it was a complete lie and he must have hid somewhere for hours. I get really creeped out thinking about it. Campus security was informed of the situation, but I never heard anything more of him. In fall of 2019, I was a freshman in college. I went to a smaller school and I lived in the dorms. I had a roommate named Danny who was a real jerk, but that's not the horror story. Sure, it was annoying to be in that small dorm room with Danny. He would talk a lot and pester me on purpose a lot of times. Because of this, I tried to spend as much time away from our dorm room as possible. I would do all my studying in different places around campus. Spots to sit and get work done were everywhere in just about every building. Even if I wasn't doing homework, I could sit and watch YouTube videos or whatever. I preferred it to being in my dorm room if Danny was there. I got into a routine of this after probably the first month. So one night, I remember that I was doing homework in this one building. 
It was the building that a lot of our classrooms were in and had several different subjects. There were about four floors to it, and I was up on the third or fourth floor, but I don't remember which one. I was in a comfortable chair that had a table attached to it. It was built for studying and stuff. There were a few of these types of chairs that looked out a window that had a nice view of campus. I took a break at about 6 p.m. and went to the dining hall to eat. I met up with a friend there and then afterwards went back to the same building at the same spot that I was at before to finish my homework. The buildings didn't close if you were a student and you could stay there as long as you wanted. By now, especially up on one of the top floors, things were very quiet and nobody else was really around. I kept working and was there until probably like 9 p.m. As I worked, I had my headphones in and played some music in the background. Sometimes I would do that and sometimes I wouldn't. It just depended on what I was doing and how I felt. So right after I was done and I took my headphones out, I heard footsteps behind me immediately. The walkway went behind me and one direction led to some classrooms and the other led to some stairs. The footsteps were coming from the hallway with some classrooms in it. I started picking up my laptop and putting things into my backpack. As I did, the footsteps got closer and closer. It didn't seem like the person was going to walk by me though. It almost seemed like they were going to approach me instead. I turned around to look and see who it was. All I saw though was somebody ducking around a corner behind a beam. I didn't get a look at the person but just saw part of them for like a second. This was kind of weird. I finished putting my things in my backpack and then stood up looking to where I saw the person again. I still saw nothing. Then I walked over to the stairs and left the building. I went back to my dorm after that. But the very next day, there was a similar experience. This time, after studying in a different building, I went to the performing arts building to study that night. This building was almost always pretty quiet. There were much less classrooms inside of it. And unless there was a concert or something going on, not many people would be there. I studied in peace for basically the whole time and saw only about two or three people walking by in the entire time that I was in there. For the last two hours probably, I saw nobody at all. The location that I was studying in was on the first floor and next to a staircase where there was a table and chair set up for studying. It was kind of out of the way, but there was a hallway going past and another one that connected. I did not have my headphones in this time and could hear everything around me. Things were very quiet and it soon got to be kind of late. At one point though, I heard footsteps coming from down the hallway. Just when these footsteps were about to get into my view though, they stopped. It was like just around the corner where I couldn't see. There was no room that I was aware of right there either. It was like the person had just stopped in their tracks. If they went back the other way or moved at all, I would have heard them. What were they doing? Were they just standing there? I had no idea. I decided to pack up my stuff and head back to my dorm. When I did, I didn't hear anything. Luckily for me, I did not have to walk past that hallway and I would be going the other way. When I left, as soon as I started heading down the hallway, I heard the footsteps again. This time, they followed me, but were still out of my sight. Then I heard them start to get closer and within my view. I turned around to see who it was that was there. I did it very quickly to not be weird so I didn't get a good look at the person. But I did see them. There was a tall and thin looking guy walking a little ways back behind me. It seemed as though he was walking pretty fast. This was way too weird and as I walked I passed by an exit door. It wasn't one of the main entrances or exits to the building but at the last moment I turned and I left. Once I was out of there I headed back for the main area of campus. The guy didn't leave the building whoever it was. I wondered if this was the same person who had been there the previous night. I went back to my dorm room and after that decided to take a break from studying around campus at night. As much as I didn't like to study in my dorm room with Danny, it wasn't the worst thing in the world. But the story doesn't quite end there. A few days later, I had classes like normal and was gone for most of the day. I returned to our dorm in the late afternoon and Danny was there. When I got into the room, he told me that someone had come by and asked for me. Apparently, somebody knocked on our door, and when Danny answered, a guy asked if I was there. I asked Danny what the guy looked like, and he said tall and thin, and basically described the same guy that I had seen the other night. I asked if the guy said what he wanted with me. He didn't say, though. Apparently, he just walked away. After that, I never saw the man again.
When I was about 17, my mom and I moved to a large city in the US. I won't name the city due to what took place, but it's a city most people are familiar with. Anyway, we moved to the city to start our new lives as my mom had bought a business and would then take ownership. This meant that I would also have to transfer schools, which was the hardest part of the move. Saying goodbye to your longtime friends paired with all of those super great hormonal imbalances of your high school years. What made it worse was that I was a junior when I moved and would have to spend my senior year with no one I knew. The last day of school came around. I said goodbye to my friends and then rushed to the airport with my mom. The instant I switched schools, I became a totally different person. I was that one outgoing girl who loved her friends only to become a random nobody who sat alone at lunch. The school itself was okay, but it was nothing like my old school. I had made a few acquaintances, but nobody I actually enjoyed talking to like my other friends. One day, I had been at lunch eating by myself when, out of nowhere, a boy I had never seen before decides to sit with me. He introduced himself as Dave and asked if he could sit with me. I tell him yes, and he begins talking about himself and claimed he was also a new student here. We spoke to each other until lunch was over, where he had walked me to my class, which I found thoughtful. It's safe to say I found Dave very relatable the more we spoke. He had the same interests and even the same family issues. He seemed very sweet, and while he was a bit off, he wasn't a threat or anything. However, little did I know that would be further from the truth. One day, Dave, out of nowhere, had texted me asking about my bra size. I told him I wasn't comfortable answering that, to which he then instantly apologized and changed the topic. But as time progressed, he'd bring up the topic even though I wouldn't want to talk about it. It eventually came to a point where I chose not to speak with him, even when he messaged me first. The same drill applied when he approached me at school too. Eventually, days went by and for some reason I didn't see Dave at school anymore. I assumed that he had finally gotten the hint and just stayed clear of me. However, I was dead wrong. The following night, I had been at home on my computer doing a project for chemistry class when I heard something hit my window. Looking back, it kinda sounded like a pebble hitting my window. After all, it was raining outside, so I assumed it was probably the wind blowing away debris. However, it then happened a second time, this time much louder. I get up from my bed and walk over to the window, and there, crouched, is someone who I could only describe as Dave. He had on his hoodie and gave me an unnerving smile when he saw me. I screamed at the top of my lungs as I saw him and ran to my mom's room to wake her up. My mom is the type of person who was overprotective of her children, so when I told her, she was rightfully pissed. Why my dad isn't home is another story, but my mom puts on her shoes and goes out of the house with a baseball bat. All the while, she's screaming bloody murder, telling whoever was here to leave or she won't hesitate to knock their teeth in. My mom is a fighter and won't put up with anyone's BS, so when she said that, she meant it. After what felt like hours, she finally came back inside hugging me and that whoever it was was gone. Needless to say, we still felt safer calling the cops and they take down our info and what had happened. Our emotion sensor light didn't work, so it couldn't alert my mom when someone was outside our house. My mom pulled me out of school for a week and demanded the school sort out the situation with Dave. Turns out, Dave had been in and out of the school for the past year and was not at all a new student. He had been suspended many times for reasons like this, only to get back in for good behavior. How he found my house is a mystery, and quite frankly, I don't want to know. 
my best guess is that he somehow followed me home. That, or he managed to track me. Either way, this is and probably will be the scariest stalker experience I've ever had. I hadn't even known Dave for a month and already something came up. I still think about this incident from time to time and just wish I'd be back at my old school. A few weeks later, I moved to another school where it wasn't the best but better by a landslide than the other one. Up until now, I try my best to stay clear of social media and outings as I'm still paranoid. This isn't a big county, meaning it was common to run into someone you knew. I hope I never see Dave again.